right, so we're looking here at an anterior view of a right radius and ulna. We only need to look at a few features of each one. We've already covered most of them. And most of them are down the distal end. So what we're going to look for first on the radius, the distal end, on the lateral aspect, we have a large styloid process. So that's distal end, lateral aspect. If we turn the radius over then to look at a posterior point of view, we can see that there's a large tubercle here right in the middle on the posterior aspect, again at the distal end. That's the dorsal tubercle. Now both of those, styloid process and the dorsal tubercle, are quite easily palpable. So they're good structures to be able to find on yourself or someone else there's that dorsal tubercle protruding posteriorly there. Now on the medial surface we have uh, an ulnar notch. So the head of the ulna, the articular surface of it, is going to articulate there. And just uh, when we thought we were finished, we are. So we'll move on to the ulna. We've got the head of the ulna first. Now the head has two bits to it. So the head is made up of an articular surface which is right here. Now if I just bring that up, hopefully you can see that there's a smooth articular surface here and then there's another part of the head here that's non-articular or at least in life that will actually have an articular disc sitting there. So it doesn't articulate directly with another bone. So that's a non-articular part but it's still the head. This bit here is the articular part the articular surface of the head. Then of course on the ulna we have a styloid process. This one will be on the medial aspect and again it's quite palpable in a living individual. Now coming up just for one structure on the proximal part of the ulna, if we're looking at the lateral surface, so here we would have a notch for the head of the radius, so radial notch, just beyond that, just distal to that, running along the lateral surface of the ulna here we have the supinator crest. So it's not this little line up here closer at coming cl closer to the end of the um, distal end of the tuberosity of the ulna. It's more posterior than that. It's this one down here. Okay, so that. And it's kind of continuous with the interosseous border which is more distal. So that's the supinator crest. So those are just the few structures that we need this week for the radius and ulna. And now let's have a look at the carpals. So here we're looking at an anterior view of a right hand. So just sitting like this and we've got plastic bones joined together by elastic string and that's really useful because they're held together in the position that they would be in in a living individual. So it means that the bones are sitting as they would be. So we've got two rows of carpals. If we start with the proximal row on the thumb side, please always be careful, make sure that's where you're starting. We've got scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum sitting posterior to the more anterior pisiform sitting in front of it. Then in the distal row, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. And when you get to the end, just check that the one you finish with has a hook if it does, well, then you've got it right. So, remember, it's kind of useful to use a sentence that has the same, the words have the same first letter as the bones, if that helps. So we have scared, lovers, try positions that they cannot handle. And that will give you scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. All right, now let's have a look at a couple of features because there's a few we need to know. Here we've got a tubercle on the scaphoid. So that raised eminence there, tubercle of scaphoid. So it's on the distal anterior part of the scaphoid. Then there's a just beyond that, just distal to that, there's a tubercle on the trapezium. Now if we look at that one in profile, you can see that one is quite large. It sticks up quite a long way. So that's the tubercle of the trapezium. And then of course, the last one, hook of the hamate, and that's huge. You can fairly easily spot that protruding anteriorly there. Now while we've got this point of view, it's useful to have a look here 
and realise that the carpels, when they're set up this way, not laying flat, um, when they're set up the way they would be in life, they really do, if you put a bit of connective tissue across here, they really do make a tunnel. So the bones themselves form three walls of the carpal tunnel. They form the lateral, medial and then um, posterior walls of the tunnel. And the flexor retinaculum forms the roof. Okay, or well, the anterior surface. And so nine tendons and a nerve are going to run through that little tunnel along with their synovial membranes. Now lastly, before we move on, let's have a look at the carpals from a posterior point of view. Now in some ways it's actually clearer from a posterior point of view. So we can just go, remember, start proximal row but on the thumb side. So make sure you're on the thumb side, proximal row. Scaphoid lunate triquetrum. We can't see the pisiform, it's on the front. Trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. So remember you go back to the thumb side to do the distal row. Now you can see seven bones there quite easily. They're all approximately the same size. Um, or closer to it than they are if you're looking from an anterior point of view where the trapezoid gets a bit hidden and the trichretrum is under the, uh, the pisiform. So if we just turn so we can see the anterior view, now we can see trichretrum here, pisiform here. Okay, so that's the carpals.